Welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast and show. I am your host, Elizabeth Upton, and as a former executive, I have seen it all. Our conversations are aimed at inspiring new ways that you can redesign your business and your life so that you can create more time, freedom, and power than you ever thought possible. If you are a highly driven business professional ranging from I have an idea to an emerging entrepreneur to a CEO who's ready to expand your team, or even if you are an employee who works for one, this show is definitely for you. Join us as we discuss strategies and tips and hacks that will help you to mind your own business, all while not taking ourselves too seriously. There's a little bit of all things business in here designed to simplify and set your life up for success from operations, marketing, sales, finance, and mindset to self-care. All of my guests have made an impact in my life and hopefully they'll do the same for you. If you love to learn and are ready to level up, you're in the right place. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome everybody to Mind Your Own Business. I'm Elizabeth Upton, so excited to have you. We have our guest here today. His name is Dave Bookbinder. He's a business valuation expert, speaker, and author. Dave, we are so excited to have you. Welcome to the show. Hey, Elizabeth. I am excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I am so fascinated by the book that you wrote. Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's so fascinating to me. Wow. So I guess the way to start that is to rewind and talk about kind of what I do as my day job. Then I can kind of dovetail into the book if that's okay. Let's hear it. Yeah. So um, if any of your uh, audience has watched Shark Tank and who hasn't, right, they probably have heard the word valuation. Um, So I'm a business valuation professional. I've been doing that for a very long time. And Shark Tank did uh, the folks in my profession a huge favor because they brought the word valuation into our living rooms and uh, dare I say made the word valuation sexy. There's a lot of reasons why companies need evaluation more than what you just see on Shark Tank. But uh, over my career, I've helped thousands of companies figure out what their businesses are worth and what their intellectual property or intangible assets are worth. One of those intangible assets is people or human capital. so I valued human capital throughout my career. I was also a single dad for about a dozen years, years excuse me, and uh, worked for some people that were really cool who understood the, uh, the challenges of being a single parent. And I learned that I would walk through fire for them because they were just great. Uh, I also got to work for some folks who maybe weren't quite as understanding and uh, maybe I didn't go quite as far for them. And I started to understand what employee engagement really meant firsthand. But um, the big takeaway was that I really believe that people are an organization's most valuable asset. They don't appear on a financial statement. And I decided that I needed to do some writing on that. And I wrote an article about it. And the article got some traction and more people started to show up in my life and tell me you need to do more, do more. And I wound up collaborating with about 20 other thought leaders across North America. And uh, the book is my journey to basically prove out my thesis that people really are an organization's most valuable asset. So I never intended to write a book. The book just sort of happened. Wow. Well, why is that? Why wouldn't human capital appear on a balance sheet? Why isn't that something that has been part of the valuation process, in your opinion? Well, early in my career, uh, there was an assembled workforce asset that did live on a financial statement. And then it devolved away from that. And the, I don't want to get too wonky here unless you really want to go down a rabbit hole of uh, valuation <laughs> technicalities and how we make the sausage, so to speak. But um, suffice to say that human capital uh, does not live on a balance sheet. It's not its own line item. Uh, in the world that, that I work in and live in every day, we value human capital and it winds up getting subsumed into goodwill, which is what's left over as all the other stuff that you can't identify. And it's kind of a catch-all bucket for what's left after you put value on things like trade name and technology and customers. Wow. Wow. It's hard to believe when the human element, the energy, what it is that people bring to an organization and dealing with clients and handling all of the aspects of business, that is what people come away with. That is the experience that people have and that they want to continue working with you or not working with you. So it's it's so interesting to me. I've never thought about it this way until speaking with you that that wasn't even something that was considered to be a major return on investment. Yeah, and that's what people have told me is kind of an interesting lens because most people who are, are talking about 
you know, valuing people and, and the employee engagement phenomenon and things like that are generally in the human resources, human uh, learning and development space. So I'm a little bit unique because I'm more of a finance guy who's speaking on this topic. So people have said that's uh, kind of a unique lens. And you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody who, who understands it gets it intrinsically. And every CEO on the planet has pounded the table and said, our people are this company's most valuable asset. Right. Fortunately, many of them oftentimes think that's just lip service. And what they really think is, our people are this company's largest expense. And how do we reduce that? But the good news is there's a, a growing sentiment around this particular topic, and I think there's a big shift happening. Absolutely. I, and I, I would say now with where we are, there's a lot of people working from home. We have such a different way. It's not business as usual as it used to be. And how important it is that you have trust in your employees and that they understand the intention of the business and the the energy that the company exudes because that's what going to that's what's going to have customers coming back that's what's going to have people trusting to work with you and and then you get into wow what is the cost of having to rehire what is the cost of having to go through the hiring process at, as vp of operations I was a part of not only the hiring process, but the training process. And it is so exhaustive. We, we had a, a very lengthy hiring process in addition to the training process. So going through that, and then you have usually the 90 day trial, is this working? Is this not working? Well, the cost of that not working is huge. Yeah, what you just described, first of all, spot on, but what you just described essentially is the valuation technique that we use to value the assembled workforce. It's a cost to replace method, and it's really what you just described. It's figuring out how many candidates are we going to be interviewing for, we'll call it the accounting department, right? How many interviews will be held at what hourly rate? Um, what's the learning curve for those individuals? And all those components, and you come up with a cost. And the cost doesn't tell you the value. There's so many things that are missing. First of all, those are what we would consider to be uh, the direct costs. So our formulas and what you didn't describe in your thesis there was kind of the, the indirect costs. But more importantly, from my perspective, is what I call the intangible within the intangible. And that's where things like engagement and tenure come in and, and all the nuanced things. Like, so for instance, uh, when you think about an M&A transaction and, uh, by the way, depending on where you get your data, up to probably 90% of M&A synergies don't happen. And it's, it's because of the lack of integration of the workforces and culture. So what is an M&A, if I could stop oh, you I'm just sorry. so you M&A, mergers sign. and acquisitions, if a company is acquired. Got it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Got wonky there. Um, <laughs> so if um, you, you consider that most of those synergies aren't realized because of the fact that we don't integrate people and culture, a lot of folks will think that everyone is the same, they're fungible, they're all replaceable, mm -hmm. and they don't think about until after the folks are gone. So for instance, let's say somebody's been with an organization for say five years, right? Um, they may think, okay, I can replace that person with anybody else off the street. Very cavalier attitude, but I'm trying to make an example here. So if they replace that person, only after they've left, do they come to understand, wow, I never knew what that person did really fully, even though that person may have left a full memorandum of their complete day-to-day -day job descriptions. It's the nuanced thing. There's little intangibles like they may know what their boss's proclivities are. How does the boss like to receive information? They'll know from a look or a, 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 a nonverbal cue if the boss is in a good mood or a bad mood, and is today a good day or, or not a good day to ask for funding for a particular project. You know, who's the go-to resource in the organization if I need to get something out of marketing, for example? All those little things that get picked up along the way that aren't gonna get memorialized uh, necessarily in a transition document. Not to mention, uh, I think we all agree that an engaged employee probably is gonna drive more value than a disengaged employee. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I, they, they bring the morale up. I don't know if you've read the book called tribal leadership, but it's a, it's a book that's fascinating to me. And it's about the, the energy of the individual and how they contribute to the energy of the whole. And you can have a lot of energy and morale and trust and rallying that gets people to a level of really being engaged and 
and enjoying what they're doing. Even though there's a lot to do when you're working, there is an aspect of being able to enjoy it, enjoying your team members, enjoying the culture of the company. And that was a big thing that we worked on. But in this book, Tribal Leadership, it also talks about how if you have one employee that is not engaged, that they will actually bring the morale of the entire team down. And having that level of engagement, which is also a big aspect of who you hire and who you have on the team and the intangible aspect that they bring to the company, it's, it's fascinating to me that even if you have one employee that isn't engaged, it can bring down the morale of, of everyone and the culture in general. Yeah, mood is contagious for sure. So for everybody who's watching or listening to this episode, all they have to do is think about when they're involved in an activity that they really love, whether it's gardening, singing, whatever it may be, sports, when they're involved, they're in a zone, they're happy, and they would do it all day long and just be in complete joy in doing it. So if you're able to go to work and feel some sense of that kind of joy, then you're obviously going to be bringing way more to the table and way more productive. But um, the bad news is across the world, uh, Gallup every year publishes their employee engagement surveys. And every year it's roughly 30 to 33%. So the way I analogize that is if you think, if you're a business owner, for example, think of your business as a lifeboat and you've got 10 people in the lifeboat, right? So you've got three in the front that are rowing towards safety you got four in the middle that are kind of looking around at the icebergs and there's three in the back that are trying to sink you. So if you can figure out the ways to turn the dial to the right on employee engagement, then that's what's going to drive innovation. That's what drives the discretionary effort. And ultimately my unique lens drives business valuation. Hmm. Wow. And I like that you mentioned mood as well, because I, there was a, a study I was reading, I think it was about how the FBI hires people. And they were looking at the curve of, of high performance individuals and trust and mood. And the way that they, in this art article described is that the trust and mood was just as important as the high performance. And if, if you were only a high performer, that wasn't enough. And if you had trust and mood, that wasn't enough. But if you, if you were right in the middle there where you had both, then you were someone that was a green light to bring onto your team. Have you found that there's any strategy around that in, in helping small business owners who are building their teams right now so that they can factor that in when they're, when they're hiring? Yeah, I've got to be very, very careful because... It, it starts with being intentional about culture and the, uh, the CEOs and business owners that I've had the pleasure of interviewing for the, the, the current book, but also for the one that's in process, um, there's a consistent theme. It's about getting people that are aligned to your mission. Um, I think everybody understands that you can always train people to perform a task. So it's not so much the resume experience. You know, have you done this before? Most people are capable of doing a task if, if given proper training. But what you can't teach is things like intellectual curiosity, being a team player and good fit. So be intentional with your culture. Uh, they all indicate that it takes probably 18 months to two years in, a, in an existing organization if you're going to do a culture shift change before it gets fully embedded into the DNA and people realize that you're not just doing the latest and greatest fad. So Say, um, say that again. I think that's a really important point. How long yeah. does it take? about 18 months to two years huh. before your people will really believe that you're sincere about making this change. So in, in the current book, uh, one of the CEOs that I talked to uh, was, was telling me in great length, and we talk about that in the book, about really embedding the culture in the DNA. And uh, I don't know if I can say a, a, a naughty bit on your show here, but he sure. implemented a no assholes policy <laughs> um, and he's enforced it. And when people saw that he was enforcing it and, and they were taking it seriously, that this culture commitment they made was legit, this wasn't about, okay, we're going to try and be trendy and keep up with everybody else, that this is really who we are. This is how we conduct ourselves. There's a little rule book for the way we approach different things, how we think about treating our fellow coworkers. Then they all bought in. And once you get the buy-in to the mission, then really cool things have happened. And he's living proof, as others are, that when you get the buy-in, everybody's rowing in that same direction, you will outperform your peers. Every one of the key performance indicators from sales to safety, profitability, turnover, you name it, all improved dramatically. Yeah. One I, other fun fact for you, just yeah. to dovetail one of the things you just said, when you talk about high performers, uh, the fun fact is uh, we talk about with uh, regard to toxic employees, 
oftentimes your best performers or the toxic employees in an organization are oftentimes your best performers, the highest isn't, performers. Isn't that interesting? What is that? Huh? I wonder, yeah. how do you even, um, how do you find out that statistic? Is that something that they've gone in and, and tested? I mean, how, how do you yeah. even get that data? Yeah, well, that's one of those funny things. And one of my the chapters in the new ROI, uh, conversations with a couple of Harvard professors who've done uh, the heavy lifting and doing the studies around that. So about wow. toxic employees, the real cost of your toxic employees. Yeah, and, 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 and with this business that you were just speaking on, that they've seen this major shift and there's been a, a buy-in and, and an incredible amount of trust and therefore high productivity. How is there an accountability in that regard? Has, have they found out some sort of way of accountability and as it relates to how people are being? Is there, is there a way to track that in terms of data? How, how do you even do that? it became easy for them because once it became embedded in the DNA, that's just who they were. And if anybody didn't behave in accordance with that, everybody was empowered to call that person out. Mm. And they all actually carry around um, a little folded booklet of their, their guiding principles. And they will literally call out another employee, pop out this little thing, open it up and say, remember, uh, rule number 16, this is how we're supposed to treat people with dignity and respect. And I don't think that you just responded to that person in that fashion. And wow. they're empowered to do that. So it just becomes part of the ecosystem. It's like the core values and then having them be alive within all the interactions that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. 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 I, and this this makes me think of where a lot of businesses are trending and heading towards more of a conscious business heart-centered way of creating the culture of being able to say this is what we believe in this is the flag in the ground and this is what we want to do and be and if i'm not being that then please call me out on it and and there's a high level of integrity and a high level of trust and when you exude that you will occur as a leader because you're showing up and you're walking your talk so I, I like to think that a lot of businesses are doing this. I know a lot of clients that I work with are really interested in this, not only doing this work for themselves first, so they can really get clear on their purpose and their mission and their calling and what they're up to, and then how that then aligns with what it is that they're creating for their business, what their mission is, what their vision is, what those core values are, and how that then aligns and trickles into all of the employees and and or, you know, if you're a small, small business, you don't have an employee yet, you have people that you're working with, you have consultants, you have mentors, right? It's something that you're able to bring into every aspect of, of your life and your business. And, and I think that that's our, I like to think that that's where we're headed. What do you think? I, I think we are. And uh, that's part of the trend and the movement that's underfoot. So um, I think Simon Sinek stated it best with start with why, right? People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So it's a great way to think about how you, you attract customers, but it's also how you attract your employees. And uh, you can talk about mission. Uh, I think most people want to be a part of something bigger. Uh, they don't want to feel like they're just grinding out widgets every day. And to the extent that there is a bigger mission afoot and that they can be a part of that, they definitely want to. So you, you see that in particular with regard to say uh, millennials and Gen Zers. Um, they'll leave for less money and they'll, they'll drop you in a heartbeat if they don't think your mission aligns with their core values, whether it's with regard to the environment or the economy or just the way you treat people with diversity and inclusion. So it's imperative as a retention strategy, as a recruitment strategy. And the good news is there's a lot of empirical data out there that will demonstrate that the companies that do the right things, the just companies. So there's an index that was created by a group called Just Capital that only invests in companies that have a certain criteria for doing the just things around various social causes or best places to work. Those good best companies outperform their peers. So you can actually really do well by doing good. Absolutely. Are there concrete examples that you have that enhance this level of employee engagement? Well, the, the evidence is that if you, for example, align your corporate brand and your culture. Mm -hmm. So um, an example I might share with you is if you think about uh, an entertainment park. So some of my, my friends at the Brandon Culture Alignment Toolkit or BCAT share this story all the time, doing some work for um, 
a, uh, a theme park. So bringing in different members of the organization to understand what their, their brand is and what their culture is, found that there's a big disconnect. So just a real quick example as a microcosm. So if you think about the, uh, the folks who are in marketing or at the, uh, the top of the org chart, the executive leadership team, they'll tell you we're in the business of fun, great family experience. But when you talk to the engineers, they'll tell you we're in the business of safety, right? We don't want to have people being killed on the rides. So somewhere it's aligning both of those to understand that they can be married together, but let's figure out as an organization, who are we and what do we represent? So by bringing the engineers into the amusement parks, for example, and allow them to interact with families and experience the fun and the joy, allow them to reframe their lens of safety, which is still critical, but around the overall corporate strategy and mission and vision around the entertainment for the family. Right. So that alignment again, it's really about how things are aligned and doing what you say, saying what you do, you know, really yeah, basic. Being consistent, being authentic. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Being your word. Um, yeah. Fascinating. And I'm curious to take it back to, to what it is that you started with, the, with valuation. So what size business would you want to have to have a valuation performed and, and what does that look like? So those of our listeners that have, don't have a full business yet, or they have an idea at what point do they want to learn about this from you and, or, okay, now what do I do with my, I'm starting my business, but what do I need to know about it? Since you, since you are the experts, spill it. Yeah. Spill it. Okay. Well, there's a couple <laughs> of things to unpack there. Um, first of all, uh, we and I work with companies of all sizes, public and private. Uh, in terms of valuation needs, uh, I think it's imperative that folks understand always early what valuation concepts are, because if you understand how valuation is calculated and you understand the variables that investors or buyers think about uh, in terms of how they may value you as a business, then you can actually make strategic decisions that will do things to enhance your value going forward, as opposed to haphazardly doing things. Um, so for example, managing your business for the avoidance of payment of taxes. Everybody gets that, small businesses. We're going to uh, protect the income from Uncle Sugar, and they operate in that fashion. But when they go to sell the business, uh, you want to make sure that your financial statements are pretty clean and that you can demonstrate to investors or buyers that you have made money because whatever multiple you're thinking you're going to get for your business, if you multiply it by zero earnings, it's still a zero. So there's a lot to be learned on that. And, the, and a lot of times, unfortunately, business owners rely on two valuation methods, um, one being the back of the napkin method and the other one being the back of the envelope method. Neither one of those is a legitimate valuation method. So you get what you pay for when you're doing the math on an envelope. Back of the envelope versus back of the napkin. What is the distinction there? It's the same garbage, just a uh, different uh, vehicle. <laughs> Just different colloquial expressions, um, because a lot of times people will say, uh, what's my business worth? Uh, you know, I don't want to go deep dive into that. Just give me, give me a back of the envelope answer. Mm. Yeah, there, there really is no back of the envelope answer. There's a lot of factors that go into uh, business valuation, lots of considerations, mm. both regarding the business, the economy, the industry, and of course, the nuances of the methodology. I don't think we have enough time to go into all that right here. But right. um, there, there's, uh, I'm happy to chat with anybody who wants any of the mind share around what goes into valuation. Yeah. And what do you think that people would need to know? Um, or I could say this way, are there any trends that you've seen with new business owners or small business owners that have been operating in the red with, is there a certain point where they should really be getting to the black? And if not, they need to seriously reconsider what they're doing. Yeah. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. Uh, I'd say that's all facts and circumstances. And uh, I'd be talking to your advisors about that because when you think about just say an early stage life sciences company, for example, you know, they may be in the red for 10 years uh, as they're you know, zero revenue working through FDA approval, uh, get a drug approved, Approved, and then overnight, they've got to hire 300 salespeople and they're a multi-million dollar public company. Right, right. Okay. So what, what do you think that people should be considering when they are starting a business as it relates to the investments that they're making, whether that's in human capital or whether that's in technology or, you know, CRM platform? Um, do you have any insight around where people should be putting their money in the very beginning of their their business 
track? Well, that's another tough question and, and hard to give you a general answer because each organization has got its own uh, timeline and, and stage of development and milestones and objectives and things like that. But early stage companies generally are kind of bootstrapped for cash. So you've got to choose your investment dollars wisely. Um, investing in the right people that can help you if you're the business owner. I've seen a lot of mistakes where the business owners are really good at what they do. They may be craftsmen or uh, they may be um, technology wizards with great ideas and they know exactly what that's all about, but they're not necessarily uh, financial people. They're not necessarily business developers. So hire for those other strengths where you are lacking and don't go it alone. Try and find others who can help you and support you, even if it's just on a fractional basis, just to benefit from that other toolbox. Got it. Got it. And what do you think then, if we were to look at the valuation aspect of it, what is the, if you were to break it down, just so we can understand how the drivers are of business value, can you, can you show us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, I can give you a quick overview on some valuation methodologies. So uh, one is a market-based approach. And if anybody's ever bought or sold a home, you'll intrinsically understand this. So if you're looking at buying a house, what's the first thing you do? Call the realtor and ask them for comps. So comps being what have other homes sold for in the neighborhood. And then when you do that, you make adjustments to the particular house you're looking at for maybe its location to shopping and transportation and things like that. Same thing in the business valuation world we'll look to comparable transactions of businesses that have sold recently. And we'll also make similar qualitative adjustments to adjust the multiples paid in those transactions to more closely fit with our subject company. Uh, another way to think about a market approach is as a privately held business, for instance, I can't buy shares in your company, but if I want to participate in the industry uh, and the upside potential and the downside risk, I could buy a basket of publicly traded companies. I could buy stocks. Right? I could pick five or 10 different companies that are in that space. So that's another way to look at it. Each of those companies has multiples. And again, we'd have to adjust their trading multiples for differences. And the last one is an income-based approach. And the idea there is, and this is really key in valuation. So if your audience gets nothing else, remember this, it's forward-looking. Valuation is about the future, not necessarily as much about the past. So it's projecting the future benefit stream and bringing it back to today's dollars at an appropriate rate of return or risk rate. So Dave, I'd love to know and break down what you think the key drivers of business value really is. Okay, so the key value, the key drivers for business value, it, it's positive cash flow, right? Cash is king. I think everybody watching or listening understands that. Um, but the key takeaway there, like I started to say before, was valuation is a forward-looking exercise. So when you think about uh, companies and, and applying multiples to last year's performance, let me give you a quick example. If you've got two companies with identical performance, financial performance last year, whether it's EBITDA or whether it's net income, and EBITDA is earnings before interest taxes, depreciation and amortization for those who aren't familiar with that term. Uh, it's a proxy for cash flow. But two companies, same numbers, um, but next year, one of them's expected to lose a key customer, revenue and, and profitability are expected to drop 25%. The other ones on a growth trajectory and revenue and profitability are projected to increase by 25%. Do you think they both warrant the same valuation because they both had the exact same numbers last year? The answer Definitely is no. not. No, because the future matters. So when you start to think about what investors and buyers really look for and, and the, the best ways to value businesses, this forward-looking methodology, this income-based method, the idea is it's not only about the veracity of your ability to forecast, but the risk associated with achieving those forecasts. So anything that you as a business owner can do that helps to de-risk your business in the eyes of an investor hmm. will increase your valuation. Got it. Got it. Are there any de-riskers that you have examples of that you can share with us? There's a multitude of things that can be done to de to, that are de-riskers depending on the, the stage and, and industry of a particular company. But the more things that you have done, the more milestones you've achieved, the more you can say, been there, done that, have a track record of proving it, have a track record of achieving those forecasts, having built a team, having a good visibility on your customer pipeline, anything that you can say, yeah, we're pretty solid on those things as opposed to, well, we're really not sure. It's, it's the wet finger in the air and maybe it's that way. Mm -hmm. um, 
that'll help to de-risk your business. And that comes with time and practice. Got it. Got it. Well, speaking of business, I mean, you have done so much. You have written a book and you have a podcast, very successful podcast. You also have uh, speaking engagements that you do. Do you have any tips for our listeners that, again, are starting out and anything that you would want to share with them that are like real, they could walk away from here and go, I could do that. Is there anything from the experience that you've had so far that you could share with us? Well, yeah. Hey, I wrote a book, so anybody could do it. Um, I didn't intend to write mine. So that was great because if you asked me, hey, do you want to go write a book? I would tell you, God, no, it's way too much work. But we talked before about doing something that was fun and um, how you put yourself into it. and It doesn't feel like work. And for me, when I started writing about this new ROI construct, it was fun. It was a passion project for me. And I, I wrote when I was inspired and I didn't have deadlines and didn't feel any pressure to deliver for something. So it happened organically and uh, it was a lot of fun. So if you have an itch and you thought about it, uh, just start. That's all. Just start. Keep going with it. And when you say ROI, I think return on investment. But what is it that that you mean by ROI? Yeah, so that's the the spin here, if you will. The book is called The New ROI, Return on Individuals. And again, it's the, it's my lens as a as a finance professional. I know that the the, ner- the term ROI resonates uh, with CFOs and CEOs and other business leaders, and I wanted to make the strong connection between ROI and the value that people contribute to the business. Awesome, awesome. Well, how can people work with you? Get a hold of you? I I have clients that I work with, and they do want to have business valuations done, and and I. I always say I'm not a CFO and I'm going to refer you to the experts. So how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, thank you for that. And I appreciate that. And, and just so you know, for anybody who's listening, uh, I'm always happy to, to share thoughts and ideas and experiences. So this isn't about pitching for, for new business. It's about sharing what I've learned and, and helping maybe uh, save some people from making some critical mistakes because I've seen the movie a few times. So mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, You can find me basically on all social media channels. Easiest way to find me is LinkedIn. I'm Dave Bookbinder. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter. If uh, you you mentioned the podcast, so if uh, your audience is interested in exploring what really matters most in business, as I say, come behind the numbers with me. So check out behind the numbers. Uh, It's available wherever you get your podcasts. It's also on YouTube as well. Uh, You can learn more about the book at newroi.com. Uh, the book is available basically wherever you would get your books, whether it's Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere else. And uh, another invitation I'd just like to extend to your audience that's on LinkedIn. If the idea that people really are an organization's most valuable asset resonates with you, I have a LinkedIn group called the New ROI, Return on Individuals. I invite you to join and be a part of the conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you for bringing the human element into the conversation because it's so important. The value that we bring to businesses, the value that we create as business owners is such an important aspect and and it's intangible. How do you even express or explain what it is that you do for an organization or for your family for that matter or in your life? And it's, it's a really important conversation to have and I'm so grateful that you've been creating this for all of us so that we can really get the impact of the human element and what it is that we bring to everything that we do in our business and our lives. Yeah, thank you so much. And like I said before, I think the good news is that it's a it's a movement that's really resonating, uh, not just with me, but others worldwide. And you're going to start to see some major changes, I think, in the landscape over the next couple of years. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dave Bookbinder, for being here with us today. We have learned a lot. And to everybody that's listening, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking your time to honor yourself and to honor and value what it is that you're up to in your life. And we are signing off. Again, I'm Elizabeth Upton and reminding you to mind your own business. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you got a lot out of what we talked about today. If you are watching from YouTube, then please give the video a big thumbs up if you did. Make sure to hit subscribe down below if you haven't already and turn on the notification bell so you never miss an episode. If you are listening from Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, because we know that there's a lot, 
please take a minute to subscribe if you haven't and give us a review. It helps others to find the show and it puts wind in our sails, literally. So please, please do that. We are at MYOB podcast on Instagram and I am at Elizabeth Upton coaching on Instagram. If you are interested in following along there, we offer a lot of bonus material and there is a link to the show notes down below in the description box, along with the resources we discussed in today's episode. Most of all, thank you for honoring yourself. Thank you for investing your time with us today. No one is going to be more of a champion for your growth than you are. So always remember that keep showing up and this is Elizabeth Upton signing off and reminding you to always mind your own business.